Feature of the evening, our continuing focus on the 10th anniversary of the 2010 Constitution. Now tonight we turn to the judiciary, the arm of the government caught between a progressive text of the Constitution and constant friction with an overbearing executive. On Katiba at 10 tonight, our very own Waihiga Mwara reports on the decade-long struggle and why the battle for true independence of the judiciary is still far from won. So we are not yet... Uh where we can say that this is uh, a thoroughly independent judiciary, but it is a substantially independent judiciary. We generally have a very uh, diminished view of our justice needs. The problem bedeviling the Kenyan judiciary is a societal problem. It's society that has a problem. We are a corrupt society. We are a thieving society. We are a very inefficient society. So how do you expect the judiciary not to reflect, you know, the, the weaknesses of the society. For many years, the Kenyan judiciary was known only as a potent tool in the hands of the president of the day to clamp down on political opponents. Independent only in theory, the courts would sit at night or even on weekends to deliver whatever ruling the executive so wished. For a long time, we were the judicial department. We were not uh, viewed as an arm of government, but rather as a department of the office of the attorney general. So what would happen is that we would get stuff from um, the ministries. All the ministries that had people they didn't want, they transferred them uh, to the judiciary. The, the Kenyan judiciary has always been defined by the politics of the time. I mean, the 80s, the 90s were the days of Kanu. The same was reflected in the judiciary. I mean, we had a judiciary that was not independent. We had a judiciary that was very subservient to the executive. We had a judiciary that was inefficient, ineffective, and corrupt. At that time, the Constitution granted the president imperial-like powers, allowing him to control the budget of the judiciary and even hire and fire judges at will. The judiciary had fewer staff and an inadequate number of courtrooms, which limited access to justice for Kenyans. The clamor for a new constitution was therefore not just about politics, it was also partly an attempt to make the institutions, such as the courts, truly count as a real check against the excesses of other arms of government. And so, with the exit of the Kanu government in 2003, the then newly elected NAC administration embarked on what would be famously known as a radical surgery in the judiciary. Allegations of corruption were directed towards 105 judges who were either pressured to resign or face tribunals. But the real tipping point would only come with the adoption of the 2010 Constitution. Adopted overwhelmingly at a referendum, the document allowed the judiciary to undergo significant reforms, including the setting up of the Judiciary Fund to signal financial independence of the judiciary, forming a judicial service commission to appoint judicial officers of integrity, and finally setting up an apex court, the Supreme Court, that would act as the final protector and custodian of the supremacy of the Constitution. Uh, the judiciary that we inherited uh, under the Constitution 2010 was, a less function, was in a less functional state, uh, it was less well uh, motivated, were less well structured, uh, uh, less learned, uh, less committed. Uh, uh, and I think that uh, in the last 10 years, we've had structural changes that have uh, improved uh, the efficiency of the court. The 2010 Constitution ushered in a new dispensation, starting with a rigorous process of appointing judges, including public vetting by Parliament. That new dispensation would produce an unlikely candidate for Chief Justice, Dr. Willy Mutunga, a human rights defender and former political detainee who was seen by many as an outsider in the judiciary. Ikifika kiwango, anaye chaguliwa kusimamia mahakama ya Kenya. Ni mwanaume mwenye amevaa vipuli katika masikio yake. Mujue tunahitaji maombi kama taifa. 
He was succeeded by David Maraga, and between them, the judiciary has made steps towards greater independence. In terms of jurisprudence, we've seen uh, very significant decisions on the whole issue of devolution and revenue sharing. In the Bill of Rights, we have seen a judiciary that um, has become more assertive. One such landmark ruling was this on September the 1st, 2017. That the presidential election held on 8th August 2017 was not conducted in accordance with the Constitution and the applicable law rendering the declared results invalid. The greatness of a nation lies in its fidelity to its Constitution and a strict adherence to the rule of law. The historic nullification of the August 8th presidential election, a decision that shook the country and the African continent and its impacts on the legal landscape continue to endure. I believe uh, the judges in the African continent have been emboldened. I also believe the people of the African continent have seen the resolve of the people of Kenya. But despite the accolades from far and wide, that decision by the Kenyan Supreme Court marked a turning point in the relationship of that institution and the executive. The president issuing a thinly veiled threat that has hung over the institution since then. But we shall revisit. We shall respect but we shall revisit this agenda. Oh, yes. Many analysts see the frosty relations between President Uhuru Kenyatta and the judiciary as directly related to that promise to revisit. In fact, the Chief Justice himself has come out numerous times to complain publicly about what he sees as frustration by the executive. They want to control the judiciary. They want to make the judiciary a puppet. In the financial year 2020-2021, the judiciary was allocated 18.1 billion Kenya shillings, whilst the other arm of government, parliament, is expected to receive 37.3 billion Kenya shillings. We don't have enough hands because you're talking about a judiciary that has below 600 judicial officers. This is judges and magistrates for a population of 52 million. The judiciary has to share money with other institutions. I imagine, uh, I, I hate to imagine how the, the, the minister, the, the secretary to the treasurer, uh, to the treasury, I, 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 I hate to imagine how, how he spends his waking hours because everybody is asking for money. One particular sticking point has been the delayed swearing-in of 41 judges, almost a year after they were appointed by the Judicial Service Commission. When I was Attorney General, we had a problem with the swearing of judges. We solved it. We sat down, I, th I then representing the judiciary, because I was on JSC side, we sat down with the executive, we, we negotiated, we, and everything ended smoothly. It can be done and it should be done, and I, I, I'm very sure it will be done. A report on the state of the judiciary 2017-2018 revealed that there had been a 39.6% reduction in case backlogs during that period, and the judiciary was applauded for making great strides in the electoral dispute resolution process. But even before COVID-19 complicated physical meetings, a survey released in 2018 showed that more than half of Kenyans polled would rather look for informal ways to settle a legal dispute rather than take the court route. Uh, on paper, uh, there's been expanded access to, to justice for everybody. But on the ground, as we say, things are different. I'll give you many examples. Uh, Let's start with the infrastructure itself. We don't have sufficient courts to enable the judiciary to perform optimally. We also don't have a sufficient number of judicial officers. And uh, therein, I put in the question of the failure to appoint the 41 judges. 
With only months before Chief Justice David Maraga retires from the helm of the judiciary, attention is shifting to the huge burden that will be resting on the shoulders of his successor. If you get the appointment of a Chief Justice and the Supreme Court right always, the judiciary can be managed properly. Mm -hmm. But when you bungle that process, when you have a very bad Supreme Court, when you have a Chief Justice that doesn't have great ideas or is not a serious you know, judge of repute, the judiciary won't to go far. I expect to see younger judges more intellectually uh, involved judges better prepared in their areas of specialization. I expect to see world-class judges. From the days of complete subservience to the executive to the current friction between the two arms of government, the Kenyan judiciary has walked a long road. And the test to the future will continue to lie in how much of the independence granted by the Constitution is lived in Kenya's corridors of justice. Wahiga Mwaura, Citizen TV.